Luke chapter 5. We'll begin reading in verse 1. So it was as the multitude passed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two boats standing by the lake, but the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon's, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and he taught the multitudes from the boat. When he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. But Simon answered and said to him, Master, we have toiled all night and caught nothing. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. And when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish, and their net was breaking. So they signaled to their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at, at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Father, as we look into Your perfect, beautiful Word, we receive these as Your heart speaking to our heart. And I pray that we would have open hearts to receive from Your heart. I pray that You would implant truth in us today that would instruct us, correct us, and guide us. I pray that we would receive this Word and be ready and willing to walk in the Word and be hearers of the Word and doers of the Word. Let Your Word come into our hearts and grow to fruitfulness. In Jesus' name, Amen. You can be seated. We find this beautiful passage in the Gospel of Luke where Peter encounters the Lord. And one of the things that I want to focus on, although there are many things to learn in this passage, the one thing I do want us to glean from here is the way that Peter responded to the Lord. See, I see in Scripture, and we'll take a look at a few instances, that when man truly encounters the Lord, if he has a heart to hear and to receive from the Lord, it will change him. Matter of fact, it will humble him. And it amazes me to this day how we present a gospel to the world that exalts man. We call this a man-centered gospel. And this is something that we need to begin to proclaim, not just the preachers from the pulpit, but the people who represent God to proclaim that the God of the Creator God who we encounter is one who brings humility to us. See, whenever Peter saw and, and was amazed and knew that this was not just a miracle working person, but he knew that the miracle was the result of a holy person in front of him. See, as God was working in Peter's heart, we know up to this point and in further building until the point that he said, Thou art the Christ, the Messiah, and there's no other place that we can go. The Lord is revealing Himself. The Father is revealing the Son to Peter. And the result of that is Peter saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man. I want you to know that is the appropriate response that we should have to God. Now, I'm not saying that we're saying when God moves in on us that we push Him away. No, when God moves in on us, the holiness of God should reveal the wretchedness of man. The holiness of God, by comparison, should re, uh, remind us and we should see how unholy we are apart from Him. Now I say that that's, that's true of someone that when they encounter the Lord and they get saved, but there's still an amazing truth that's present there even in the forgiven, cleansed, sanctified believer in the presence of God realizes how wretched he is apart from God and he is always in this state of humility before God. Let's take a look at another individual who had an encounter with God like this in Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6, we read about Isaiah. And in the year, in verse 1 of Isaiah chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord, I, Isaiah, saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of His robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim. Each one had six wings. With two He covered His face. With two He covered His feet. And with two He flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house 
was filled with smoke. Imagine the scene, if you will. How beautiful and amazing and how um, awesome it would be. And whenever you would be before the Lord in a way that, that Isaiah was in all this uh, uh, um, majestic presentation before Him, this is the response that we find in verse 5, Isaiah, to this scene. And he says, So I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah, like Peter, whenever he encountered the Lord, it made him realize how unholy he is in the presence of a holy God. And we need to be like that to this day. Again, I want to challenge you to go against the grain of mainstream corporate church that's become so popular that exalts man whenever man should be humbled in the presence of a God that needs to be exalted. See, God did not come here so that you could receive glory of yourself. Matter of fact, we only receive glory because we are in the one receiving glory and we share in His glory, but we are not desiring of glory. It's just something He gives to us, but never should we seek it. And yet today, there is still man doing what man does and man has always done. It's him wanting to receive glory. And we need to, as a church, be a church who puts a check in our heart concerning the glory that we want. I want you to know that man wants to be glorified. He wants to be glorified. You want to be glorified. Now, I, I, I know you might be uncomfortable with that. And you might even be thinking, well, somebody else, but not me. Okay, let's go ahead and just talk about it. Maybe not you, but in your flesh. And you need to acknowledge that your flesh is always with you till the day that you die. It'll always want to be glorified. And if you're not aware of that and you don't accept that, He will seek His glory and He will do it at the cost of Christ. At the cost of God getting His glory, He will seek the glory. There are people to this day who seek the glory of man in the presence of God in His church who should be glorified in His church and man is still seeking glory. It happens in pulpits all across the church. It, uh, it happens on the stage, in the platform, in the worship all across many churches. I know today, I don't know if it was planned or not, this light wasn't on. I need it because I can't read without it. But they didn't, have, they, this, they didn't have light on. I don't know, maybe that's good. Maybe you couldn't see them. You don't really need to see them. What you need to see is the Lord. I'm not trying to tell you all that's what you need to do from now on. But I'm saying we need to be a people who are saying, I don't need to be seen. I don't need to be glorified. God needs to be glorified because woe is me. Apart from Christ, I am nothing. And matter of fact, I'm still nothing apart from Christ, even though I have Christ. I see the brokenness and the wretchedness in me in the presence of my God. So I want us to read in Ezekiel chapter 36. A beautiful passage that I love so much. Ezekiel chapter 36. And we'll start reading in verse 29, I think I done forgot. Ezekiel. Thirty-six. We'll start re reading in verse twenty-nine. In this passage, we read about the children of Israel, and they're being restored after years of rebellion, and and so this 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 restoring and this healing from God. I believe in this passage and another place in Ezekiel is the way that God always wants us to see our salvation. And this is the way that I always see my salvation. And it so helps me. And I want it to so help you also. And so in this, in this passage about restoration of Israel, Ezekiel in chapter uh, 36 and verse 29, I will deliver you, says the Lord, the Lord is speaking. I will deliver you from all your uncleanliness. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine upon you. And I will multiply the fruit of your trees and the increase of your fields so that you need never again bear the reproach of famine among the nations. And so he's talking about this great healing that he's going to bring. He's going to bring this great healing. But this is what it also he says in verse 31. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. 
I want you to know something. I loathe myself and my sin and my iniquities. I remember. I'm constantly aware of that. I'm not talking about I have condemnation over my life. I'm not talking about that this thing keeps me from understanding who I am in Christ. I'm talking about it keeps me understanding who I am without Christ. It, it keeps me in my dependency on Him because I know that I'm not holy. He is holy. And I know that, that it's but for the grace of God and His mercy, see? I know and I remember. And it's good that I remember. I want to forget, but I dare not forget. I know. I know how bad that I was. And I know how bad I would still be if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God, my faith and my surrender to Him, who I would be apart from Him. And that's so important that we remember that in a society and in a church culture today that wants you to think about how awesome you are and how amazing you are. It says this in verse 32, Not for your sakes do I do this, says the Lord God. All this healing. He says, Let it be known to you be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. What he's saying, I'm doing this, not you. You're not accomplishing anything. I'm doing this, and you need to be a, a constantly aware that you of your own accord are filthy and undone. You are unrighteous. And if you don't have a good hold on that, you are not going to be able to walk in humility. You will not respond to God the way that Peter does. You will not respond to God the way that Isaiah does. You will respond to God as if you've done Him some great favor by accepting Him as you put Him out on the scales to weigh and see if He's worthy or not. And then whenever you grant Him your surrender or your Christianity or your walk, you're somehow doing Him a favor. See, this is wrong. This is the, the man-centered gospel that is presented to the church today that makes it about man. When I want you to know, the gospel is about Jesus Christ. And we need to be focused on Him and consciously Constantly aware of our own wretchedness. And I'm not talking about to the point of condemning, but awareness, a self-aware of how ugly I am apart from Christ. See, that's why, and I've been saying it a lot lately, but I'm going to say it again today. See, a humble follower, if you'll look in your outline, a humble follower embraces their own wretchedness. A humble follower embraces their own wretchedness wretchedness that's why we sing this song amazing grace how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me i once was lost but now i'm found i was blind but now i see it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved how precious did that grace appear the hour i first believed the grace of God, I can't separate myself from it. And I'm just talk, I'm not talking about how I'll somehow I'll lose the grace. I can't separate myself from the awareness of His grace that was, that was given and granted on me. And it makes me understand and know why I ought to live my life a certain way for one who has given His mercy and His grace to me who did not deserve it. See, I, I did not deserve it. I did not earn it. And because of that, I know that he saved a wretch like me. And when, I, and when I sing that song, that's why I want you to know, church, why is that song still being sung so many years later? Why is that song still important? Because some people along the way finally get a hold of what it's saying right there as this writer is declaring Scripture straight and true. And then all of a sudden, a new generation gets a hold of it. And I pray that this generation gets a hold of it and the next. See, we need to be reminded that a humble follower embraces their wretchedness. And by that I'm saying, if it wasn't for my awareness of my wretchedness, I would be haughty, I would be high-minded, I, I would be prideful. Do you follow me on this church? I embrace that my wretchedness is what brought on His grace. I embrace that, that my wretchedness is, 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 is nothing. My wretchedness, I can't bring anything to the table. I can bring a surrendered heart and His love on me. And But because of my awareness of my wretchedness, I cannot be high-minded. I cannot be prideful. Because God reminds me, and I want Him to remind me, lest I be exalted. I want you to read about another encounter. In Judges chapter 6, verse 11. Judges chapter 6. We read this account in the book of Judges about a man named Gideon. 
and Gideon at this time, the children of Israel were under oppression from the Midianites. And the Midianites would come in and take their grain and all that. And so you actually have this man Gideon who's hiding down in a hole in the ground, threshing his wheat so that nobody can see him. And it says, The angel of the Lord came and sat underneath the terebinth tree which was in Oprah, and which belongeth to Joaz the Abersrite, will while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. You mighty man of valor. Oh, don't we like those titles like that? We like to bestow them on one another too. Yeah, we like to say, Oh, man, look at the man of God, the mighty man of valor. Oh, what that woman of God and all that kind of stuff. I ain't saying we shouldn't do that. We need to honor one another. The problem is, is whenever we desire it and we expect it. You know, the Bible talks about the word reverend. I, I just grow, I grew up, my dad telling me, you know, we, you shouldn't be asking people to call you reverend. If you show reverence to somebody that's good, you should do that. But I, I know people who expect to be called reverend. I, I get uncomfortable when somebody calls me that. If they call me pastor, that's just a, a, a lowly shepherd role. That's all that is. And I'll, I want to embrace that role as a shepherd who loves the Lord's sheep. And I'm an under shepherd. But this reverend thing and all that kind of stuff. People, but see, today that's what people want and they expect. As a matter of fact, I'll rever revere you. You revere me. I'll, I, will, I will boast about you and you boast about me. But this is the way that, that Gideon responds. Gideon says to him, oh, my Lord, if the Lord is with us, then why has all this happened to us? He's thinking, man, the Lord can't be with us. We're talking about the Lord is with you. And where are all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, did not the Lord bring us out of Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken, in a, forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And he's not, now it doesn't mean that he's blaming the Lord for anything. He's just saying, I'm making an observation that God has said, I'm done with you. That's what he's saying. The Lord turned to him and said, Go in this might of yours, and you shall save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have I not sent you? Now, I love the way that Gideon responds. He says, So he said to him, Oh, my Lord, how can I save Israel? How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. See, my clan is the weakest of the clans, and I'm the weakest in my clan. And the Lord said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites. I want you to know that this humility that Gideon had is why the Lord used him. He said, I'm the least, and I'm the least of the least. But what does the Bible say in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 11? Jesus says, But he who is greatest among you shall be your servant, and whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who himself humbles himself will be exalted. He said, he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. So that can be a little bit tricky. He who is among you, the greatest among you will be your servant. You got to look at him, Jesus talking to a collective crowd. So if Jesus was talking to this crowd, he says, the greatest in this room among you is the one who's serving. The greatest in this room, the greatest among you shall be your servant. I mean, whoever's the greatest in this room, that person's actually your servant. So the servant is the greatest. And see, those who humble themselves and lower themselves and don't think too highly of themselves, they are the ones that the Lord will use. Matter of fact, if you look in your outline, a humble follower embraces their lowliness. They embrace their lowliness. A humble follower embraces their lowliness. In Ephesians chapter 4, and verse 2, it says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. See, this lowliness is what God uses, this humility. And in a society and a culture where we're all supposed to be exalted and we're all supposed to be lifted up, we become completely unusable to God. Completely unusable. I want to read this to you in Proverbs chapter 16 in verse 24. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant words are like a honeycomb, sweetness to the soul and health to the bones. Pleasant words. I want you to know that pleasant words are good for you. They're healthy for you. That's actually what it's saying right there. Pleasant words are like honey. They're good for you. 
And we need to encourage one another. And sometimes we're feeling low. And sometimes we're feeling de dejected. And sometimes we're having an identity crisis and we don't know who we are in Christ. And we've been beaten down and we're downtrodden. And so we need that, those pleasant words to come in and encourage us. And somebody can come in and encourage us. But I want you to know that we live in a society that is very lacking in low self-esteem. We live in a society that is full of pride. We are one of the most prideful nations on the planet. And so in our situation, we have honey just dripping on us all the time. You're this, you're that, you're awesome, you're good, you're great. And so this honey that was always being poured out on us has become something that's actually become unhealthy to us. See, that's all we want to live on now. We just want to live on honey. And so we don't have any good meat of the word. and We don't even have milk. We're just living off of the honey and we're overdosing on the sweetness of the honey is all we want to hear is about how great we are. All, all I really need is for you to encourage me. And this is the man-centered gospel. The gospel that's been reduced to, uh, you're pretty. God loves you. You're pretty. And God wants to give you the best of these things. And so I, I even see it in some of our Bible studies. As we've looked at, at some of the material for our Bible studies for the ladies. I've looked at it. And, man, there's too much of the material that's out there. Say, God, oh, God wants you to know he thinks you're pretty. Come on. I mean, no, God wants you to know you're ugly. I'm not talking about in the outward appearances that we're ugly. We're sinful. We're wretched. God wants you to know it so that you will fall on your knees and repent before him. We need more of that gospel than we do all this. You're pretty gospel. We need some hard in your face. You're wrong. You need to repent. You need to get on your knees before the Lord. And I've even been told that, man, I feel like we get beat up every Sunday in here. I'm sorry, but we got to. I'm sorry, but God has called us to repentance. God has called us to repentance. And I want you to know that true repentance is encouraging. And I want you to know that God has called me to repentance. And if, if, you, if you're called to repentance once a week on these altars, I want you to know I'm getting called to repentance every day. Several times a day. It's a way of life. We've been talking about this. I hope you'll embrace it this morning. But we need to get away from... See, it's okay if somebody is feeling low that they need to be encouraged and lifted up. But most of, of, our, of, our, of our nation today is prideful. We live off of everybody's compliments. I need you to like my page. I need you to like my status. I need you to like my pictures. Don't I look pretty? And so we need to start saying, hey, you know what? We don't need to live off of that. Everything that we revolve around is somebody going to like and approve of me. And I'll tell you something. That is honey that you're striving and living off of. And, and, it, and it's popular. You will fill the seats of the churches if that's what you're preaching. And I'm not going to call any names, but I'm going to say, you've got the, the, some of the best-selling author preachers have books that are about your best life, becoming a better you, it's your time, it's all about you, 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 you. I'll tell you something, we're overdosing on the sweet honey stuff, and yeah, there are passages that talk about encouraging us, but we need some passages that bring conviction and bring us down and humble us. And we're in need of that. See, we need to cut back on the honey. We really do. Even our worship songs. I was so glad I didn't talk to Amanda. didn't tell her anything about what I was preaching on. But I was so glad when I saw the list come into the songs. I was like, none of these songs are about us. They're all about God. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. But I want you to know that, and I'm not going to say any names, but the, probably the biggest artist, Christian artist of last year, the biggest song from that Christian artist, I looked up the lyrics of that word. And for every one time that they mentioned God, there was 10 mentions of me or I. I want you to know that that's what we're flocking to as a church. Tell me more about how great I am. Tell me more about how I am this and I am that. I want you to know sometimes people are feeling low and they need to be lifted up, but that's all we're flocking to anymore today. And I'm going to tell you something, it's unhealthy. We become spiritually unhealthy as we're consuming too much honey. We just focus on verses that appeal to that one part of us. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Boy, have you heard that verse? Well, we're hearing those kinds of verses and oh, we're more than conquerors. I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. Yeah, 
Yeah, but we need to have uh, 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 more. I'm going to tell you, we need more of all the conviction about how we are sinful and how our righteousness is as filthy rags and how the wretched man's heart is completely evil against God and that we need to repent of this. And this is something I want to remember. Amidst all of this that we see and know about God is good, I want you to know that God is good to us. He does He does say that, that, that uh, we are more than conquerors. He does say that we were fearfully and wonderful wonderfully made but he also says you i made you perfect huh that's god see let's not get caught in, let's see the god in that and not the we in us so he says you were wonderfully made i made you wonderfully i'm a good creator how did we miss glorifying god in the middle of that verse we always hear is like i am wonderfully made do you hear me this morning church that passage about how awesome god is and so we need to start realizing that we are in need of walking in humility. And I want to read this to you in Romans chapter 7. In Romans chapter 7, I'm just going to cover a little bit of this. Uh, I've preached through the whole book of Romans, so we have broke all this down. So I don't believe that we're compromising any, any way. Go back and, and watch those sermons. But in Romans chapter 7 and verse 21. I find then, Paul writes, a law. And when he says a law, it just means like the law of gravity. It's not, oh, you break this, you're wrong. He says it's just a fact, it's a reality. He says, I find this truth that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. Meaning me, the one who wills to do good. I have a will, I have a desire to do good, and yet I find that evil is present with me. I want you to understand that, church. I know that there's different doctrines and understandings, but I believe that it's what it, it, it makes me able to walk with the Lord. It's my constant awareness of my flesh that doesn't want to walk with the Lord. And if I ever turn and think that that's not there anymore, I believe it will overcome me. But because of that, it keeps me humble. Like a thorn in the flesh, it keeps me humble and dependent on God for righteousness. I have to depend on God for righteousness. I have to depend on God for holiness. I have to depend on God because this flesh, this evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God, verse 22, according to the inward man. There's a man in here. That's me that, that wants to do good. I love the law of God, but I see somebody else that's hanging out in there too. I see another law in my members, in here with me, and warring against the law of my mind. Warring against the law of my mind. Bringing me into captivity of the law of sin which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from the body of this death? I love that Paul paints this picture intently to have us see this state of, of, of wretchedness and, and this absolute hopelessness state so that we can see the hopelessness and then get the hope from that. He says, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with my mind I serve the law of God, but the flesh always serves the law of sin. The flesh never improves. The, ne the flesh never gets sanctified. The flesh never repents. But I am sanctified. I am set apart. I am holy because I've been right, uh, clothed in the righteousness of Christ. And so because of that, this flesh becomes dead. And that's like killing it. And that's why it says, I kill this man, this old man. I have to kill him. I have to kill him every day. And so because of that, I'm constantly aware. But I would like to say that that man has nothing to do with Steve. But that is Steve. That is the old man. I have to take some ownership for that. Because I take ownership that that's who I am apart from Christ. It keeps me humble. And then I believe useful for the gospel. He says then, that because of this, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with my mind, I serve the law of God, but my flesh will always be ugly. What does that flesh bring? What's in that flesh? Galatians chapter 5, verse 19. In Galatians 5, 19 through 21, Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambition, dissensions, heresies, envy, murder, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I have told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. I want you to know all those horrible things that I just listed right there are within arm's reach of me if I want them in the flesh. It's always constantly with me. But I'm not controlled by it. But I'm ever aware of my need for Jesus Christ. Do you follow me on this? So I can't get haughty. I can't get lifted up. I can't think, think highly of myself. So you'll find in, in your bulletin that a humble follower is Christ-centered, not self-centered. 
I see that I, I, Steve is nothing. My righteousness is filthy rags. I have to be centered around Christ. And you know what I need to do? I need to cut back on the honey. <laughs> I need to cut back on the honey. We need to cut back on the honey. Our society needs to cut back on the honey. All we want to hear are these sweet words that talk about how awesome we are. But this is what Proverbs also says about honey in verse 25 and 16. Have you found honey? Eat only as much as you need, lest you be filled with it and vomit. <laughs> See, we got bloated bellies full of honey, no meat, and all we are full of is about how great and how awesome we are. Also in this same chapter, in verse 27, Proverbs 25 and 27, it is not good to eat much honey. To seek one's own glory is not glory. It's not good, see. We want people to say nice things about us. We want them to, to like our page. And we want them to like our pictures. And we want us to, to, to uh, adore us and, and to say great things about us. And so we even reach out and the gospel has become centered around telling you how awesome you are. That's why the songs are so popular that are all about uh, you are this and you are that. How about some of the you ain't all that? You ain't all that. You ain't nothing. We need more songs about that. And that's why you got these hymns laying around here while we sing them sometimes. Maybe need two more times. These all here talk about how you ain't and how he is. Amen. And we need to start walking and living like I ain't but he is. See, it ain't about me. But once you have become humbled, you become useful useful so i want to read again where we started in luke chapter 5 you know peter had come to know the lord or experience the lord and this is what happens after he experiences the lord and so we left off reading earlier in verse 7 or verse Eight, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he, in verse 9, and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish which they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on, you will catch men. So when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. See, this humility was great ground, fertile ground for God to call and commission him to go and to be a fisher of men. Now, our, our, our society is so self-centered and so self-promoting. I don't believe that, that uh, enough of us are experiencing God in this way where he finds our humility and our brokenness and says, I can use that. What about Isaiah? I like what happened to Isaiah also. Isaiah chapter 6. In Isaiah chapter 6. He says, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King of the Lord of hosts. Isaiah says, Man, I am not, I am undone. I am undone. I am unclean. I am unworthy. Much like Gideon, much like like uh, Peter's response. Then the one of the seraphim, it says, this is what happens after verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken with the tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin is purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. See, once he humbled himself, and he realized who he was apart from God. Without the cleansing um, uh, uh, holiness of God, he was undone. Depart from me. I'm not worthy of anything, but because of that humility. The same thing with Gideon. Then all three of these men were commissioned to do great work for the Lord. And that's where we need to be. That's where we need to be today. We need to step away from this culture and the churches today that are, it makes it about man. We need to be about God. The gospel is Christ-centered, not man-centered. The gospel is about we're saved for Christ, for His purpose. We are His workmanship. We need to stop thinking about the salvation is for us. Man, we benefit from the fact that God wants to save us for Himself. Can you grab that this morning? We're benefactors of the fact that He wants to save us for Himself. He created us for Himself. He's the Creator. He gets to do all that. That's His prerogative. But we're blessed. 
And we're benefactors of the fact that He wants to create us for Him. We are His workmanship. And in closing, I want us to consider this verse in Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. We're going to put that up there. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let each esteem others better than themselves. Leave that up there for a second. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind let us each esteem others better than himself. If we can... If we can grab that truth right there and we can embrace it and literally esteem others better than ourselves, I want to tell you something, we can become useful for God. Put it back up there one more time. Sometimes we've got to meditate on it. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness of mind, let us esteem others better than ourselves. Mm -hmm.